Carlo, welcome. Great. Thank you. <laughs> welcome Thank you to London much. and welcome to Waterstones. Thank you very much. Um, we're here to talk about your, your latest book, The Order of Time, um, which let me say, first of all, is a handsome volume, uh, beautifully produced, uh, a gorgeous book to hold, um, but also a lovely book to read. You have a great ability to condense and, and to sort of um, convey quite complicated things in a very simple and, and easy to digest way. Although the, the truth of this may be exposed in the, our conversation, we'll see how much I've managed to retain from your <laughs> book. Um, let's start off with how we perceive time. We all have a pretty good idea about how time works for us. And in fact, anybody watching this video will see a, what time is. Well, they'll see a timeline at the bottom, won't they? There's a little marker. Uh -huh. and it starts on the left-hand side and it moves through the video and it tells you how long it runs for and then it comes to the end. So we have this sort of flow of time that starts past, present, future and that's how we perceive time. But that's not quite right, is it? And that, we have a cup of coffee here in our cafe. We know that this coffee can only get colder as time goes on and that's to do with entropy. Entropy. And that's part of the reason why we perceive time as, as, as having a past, present and future, isn't it? Is that right? That's perfectly right. Okay, good. Very well. <laughs> <laughs> you passed my exam. Okay, good. <laughs> is that the easiest way to explain sort of where we get our idea of time from, do you think, is, is to do with how we perceive the way the world works around us? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, I think that this, uh, um, this little bar that becomes longer and longer and longer, it's a perfect metaphor of time, it's a perfect way a f perfect representation of the way we we conceive time in our in our mind. We have this idea of this uh, this long stretch which is growing. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, it's oriented the past is different the future, um, and uh, it's the same for everybody. Like everybody looking at this uh, um, video goes through the same steps, and we're all in the same moment of time in mm -hmm. the moment in which we we, we exist and we are, um, and. Uh, as you said, uh, uh, the uh, intuition of that comes very much from uh, entropy because entropy is what measures the difference between the past and future. Uh, it's uh, it's a, 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 a way of, it's a physicist way of talking about the fact that the past is different from the future. Mm -hmm. Your coffee there is going to get colder and colder and colder and colder and it's not get, getting hotter by itself sitting there. Mm -hmm. So it's the orientation, it's the direction of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, this kind of phenomena, this set of phenomena is, is as you said, is one of the main uh, um, sources for us of this feeling of time. Mm -hmm. um, I think another source is uh, uh, our own expectation of the future. Right? We, um, if you look at video, you want to know what's going to mm -hmm. happen next. So you're, you're there with your curiosity of what's the next thing going to be said. And our memory of the past, we remember and we hold this together. Mm. But you see, the, the key point is that we're talking about complex things. Memory, expectation, entropy. Entropy is, is, is all the movement of the molecules. Mm. Uh, not about something simple and fundamental. So all these are complex things, while um, somehow we go to school and they tell us, oh, there is time, it's flowing by itself before anything else. Uh, um, there's this Newtonian idea of a fixed universal time that flows. Uh, and it misses the fact that our intuition of time is not that one. It's the complexity of all mm -hmm. our experience of the coffee being getting cold, uh, our expectation, our memories. Uh, so time is a complex thing, it's not a simple thing. That's what I'm, I'm glad to hear that. It is a complex thing. You mentioned there the Newtonian idea of time, which is that it is constant and it, it runs whether things are happening or not. And the counterpoint to that is the, is the classical idea, which is that time only exists if things are happening. And you talk about how actually it's that older Aristotelian idea, which is m probably m well, not more accurate, but, but closer to the truth. It's a one uh, that remains valid when, uh, with physics, uh, um, we, uh, we go out from our experience of just coffee uh, <laughs> cups uh, <laughs> and conversations, and we look at atoms, we look at uh, things smaller than atoms, we you look at galaxies, things larger than um, our user experience, we look at things that move very fast, uh, uh, and so on, and then 
we understand that our this this little bar that grows, this idea of time doesn't work very well mm. uh, there. Time is more complicated. So our experience of time is no good anymore. Newtonian time, this click, click, click of the entire universe all together, mm. does not work anymore. And we need some more elementary, more basic idea of what time is uh, that w still works. And is the one you mentioned. is old Aristotelian classic, as you said, idea of time is just counting um, things happening. So uh, what is the really ultimate time? Well, it's day and night, day and night, day and night, and we count them. One, two, three, four, five days. That's time. So it's not something that passes by itself. It's a counting of happening of things. It's local, it's here. Uh, it, it refers to what, to, 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 to it's, it's, not, it's not a universal time in the, in the, in, in the entire large um, universe. And uh, it's just a way of numbering happenings. Mm -hmm. That's the idea of time that remains uh, the, the most general one. All the rest, uh, we have discovered, I would say with a certain surprise, uh, that it's not universal. It's not true that time is one-dimensional. It's not true that the past is so different from the future, et cetera, et cetera. You're wearing a watch. And I'm I, wearing a I watch. Have, I have brought a watch down. And okay. for anybody who, who doubts this idea that time is not a, a constant thing, you have proof, don't you, that, that with if, if these two watches were far more complex and far more accurate at measuring time, you could very simply demonstrate Yes, and in fact, yes, and that's something which is done routinely in a laboratory nowadays. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until a decade ago, I would say, but now we have uh, uh, an al analogous of these two watches. Uh, uh, let's hold it. And, and, uh, and uh, um, what you can do in the lab is raise one mm -hmm. and uh, then bring it back, uh, and you see that they measure different time because there's more time upstairs than downstairs. And that's to do with the effect of gravity. That has to do with the effect of gravity. Gravity is one of the things that alters, changes time. Mm -hmm. So the more you go close to the Earth, the more you go close to a mass, the more time slows down. There's mm -hmm. literally less time down there than up. So our feet have a shorter life than our head. That's, see, the, and these are the things in your book where you read them and you have these little moments of kind of mind blown. <laughs> when you look, because it is such a simple concept, and as you say, it's, it is measurable. Oh, it's measurable, and yeah. And the same thing happens with speed, so that if you... Yeah, the same thing happens with speed. That's another effect that slows down time. So again, if you take the two clocks, and if this were good, pretty clock here, pictures. Um, if, you, if, you, uh, if you move one mm -hmm. fast and then bring it back, uh, this is late okay. with respect to this one. So again, one way of... Uh, um, having less time of remaining young with respect to your friends uh, is to run a lot. Now, of course, if, if you run a lot with your feet, the effect is so small, mm. it's real, but it's so small that um, you gain um, a fraction of a nanosecond <laughs> during your entire <laughs> life, so it's not worthwhile <laughs> running all the time. Um, but if you, if you could mount on a, on a spaceship and, and, and go very fast and come back, uh, mm. you could come back and see all your friends very old and you're still young. Why is it important for us to, to have a better understanding of, of how time actually works? Is it to, you mentioned in the book that what we have at the moment is a, is a fuzzy view of, of the world, and that's to do with how we are able to observe it. Uh, by looking closer, and the work that you do looking at, at, at quantum loop gravity, when you're looking at quanta, when you're looking at something that small, time doesn't exist really at that level, does it? And is it because of trying to make sense of that that world, uh, that it is important to change the perception of, of time? Um, yes, mm, certainly. So if you want to l understand quantum gravity, understand the, the structure of the world in the minute, um, at very small scale, also if you want to understand what happened in black holes, you want to understand what happened at the beginning of the universe, uh, we have to rethink time, so to get more clear ideas about time. So we have to go through this uh, rethinking about time. Um, but ultimately, I think what's interesting is not really black holes at the beginning of the universe. It's, it's our self. Mm -hmm. Namely, um, once we understand that a lot about time depends on our brain, on our way of being in the world, or our special being ourself, uh, uh, we rethink ourself, mm -hmm. in a sense. And so uh, 
I think that's what is the most fascinating aspect of time. Um, it's not just about the world. Is that um, we have to understand time. We also have to figure out what it means to be conscious, what it means to have memories, what it means to have anticipations, because that's a crucial part of our common idea uh, of time. So it's a, um, it, it's not just physics. It's physics, it's neuroscience, uh, it's psychology, it's philosophy, mm -hmm. and it's also um, having to deal with our emotions. Because uh, one of, I think one of the main points I make in the book is that um, emotions are an integral part of our feeling of time. Mm -hmm. So what we, when the little bar that you mentioned at the beginning grows, uh, is not just a rational observation of a growing thing. There is an expectation, there is a memory, and, uh, and uh, we are held together as human beings by memory, expectation, and fear of mm -hmm. the time that passes. It's deeply inside us, uh, this little anguish of the passage of time. But the passage of time is at the same time an opening of the future and something that takes uh, away things from us. Um, and reflecting about all this, I think, helps us understanding ourselves. Do, do you think it actually a better understanding of it would help to remove people's anxiety and their fear and their, and their worries about our allotted time on Earth? It does for me, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are different and we are complicated and we are very multifaced uh, as human beings, even more than time. Mm. Um, but it certainly did for me. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, rethinking ourselves as um, creating our time, that, uh, that is the time of our life and the span of time and the time that we conceive, right? Time is a, uh, one of the key points I make in, in the book, which is um, an observation that comes from philosophy um, and from neuroscience, is that uh, uh, in reality, uh, when we think about this line that grows, which is time, uh, we are actually having a memory of the past and anticipation of the future, so it's always in the present. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are aware of time because we have memories and anticipations. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, uh, time is always entirely in the present. Uh, we hold time, we are special machines in the universe uh, that in, style of, uh, in each moment uh, span away from the present moment to other events that we call past and present. Uh, and that's what we are. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> you, in the course of the book, you use many um, different cultural uh, sort of sources to explain your ideas. Sometimes it's ancient cultures, sometimes it's quotations from books, sometimes it's lyrics from songs. Is that because you find yourself as somebody who's clearly engaged in culture, that that's the easiest way to ex explain no. things, or is it? No, no, not at all. Um, it's, not, it's not a way to explain things. Um, and it's not a way to make the book prettier <laughs> and more interesting <laughs> to read. No, no, not at all. Is that um, our knowledge, um, it's for the same reason for which I talk about Einstein and, and I talk about Boltzmann. I don't talk about Einstein because it's cute to talk about Einstein, mm -hmm. because we learn things from Einstein. Mm -hmm. Einstein was the first one to realize things that turned out to be correct, and so we own him this understanding. And in the same manner, we own uh, some um, uh, writers uh, uh, in literature some understanding. We own Proust some understanding mm -hmm. about time. We own some philosopher. Um, and uh, uh, so I make reference to thinkers or, 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 or people or music um, when I think there is something to learn there. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk about St. Augustine, I talk about some ancient um, uh, Latin poet, Horace, which is the opening of each, uh, uh, of each chapter of the book, uh, because these are all the sources uh, from which my own thinking of time comes from. Mm -hmm. um, I've learned from some ancient uh, Buddhist text uh, <laughs> from India, uh, from modern philosophy, and I think um, culture is the uh, conversation that comes from bringing all these pieces of knowledge together and trying to fold them 
in something that is meaningful for us. And that's what I try to do. So in the book, there is a lot, most of the book, which does not come from me, of course. Mm. There's also part of the book, which is my own work on the nature of time as a physicist, uh, uh, my own ideas about uh, the relation between the coffee uh, cooling uh, down uh, and the sense of time that we have, the particular variable which we call time. But a lot is just uh, bringing together uh, what we have learned about time from physics, from philosophy, uh, and from literature, mm. and from an ancient Buddhist monk also. Just to finish off, on, on the front cover of your book, um, we have this little belly band that says, New from Carlo Rovelli. And obviously, with your first book, Seven Brief Lessons on Physics, you have built a, a name for yourself already, and people would be, as your publisher knows, interested to know what you have to say next. I just wondered how it feels for you as a, as a theoretical physicist, an academic, to now be thrust into a slightly more public spotlight. Um, there have been comparisons to Stephen Hawking in terms of how you explain uh, physics to, to the layman like, like me. How do you feel about that? Is it something that you enjoy, relish, sort of deal with? Uh, how, how does that feel? Um, it's a very good question. I don't know the answer because I don't know yet. I haven't <laughs> got used to that um, yet in reality. I still think of my, if I think of myself, I think of the physicist who does his own calculation of notebook on the, and it happened that I wrote a couple of books and uh, I'm very happy of the response of the public, mm. right? So people write to me. Uh, um, it's, it's a great feeling, of course, the, the sense that people are interest in, uh, interested in um, it. It's a surprise, and I'm not, I'm not, get used, not yet used to it. Mm. Um, I would say it's a particularly a surprise, because uh, um, both in my work as a sci scientist, I mean, a little bit all scientists in something like theoretical physics have the same feeling. Uh, but especially because of my life history, I've always been, I always felt myself a little bit disconnected from the world. Mm -hmm. um, as an adolescent, I was an adolescent that would go his own way and feel totally disconnected to the world of adults. Uh, but then I grew up. Um, I went to, I lived in America as, as an European in America who felt disconnected from America. I came back to Europe uh, and felt uh, an American who was <laughs> disconnected from Europe, and so on and so forth. So I, I felt a little bit disconnected from the world, like following my own path and my own ideas. And even, I was afraid often of saying exactly what I thought about things, mm -hmm. because people would not understand, people would disagree, mm -hmm. I mean, people, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I started writing these books, putting my thinking, and to my surprise, uh, people react and say, oh, that's interesting. Mm. I'm afraid that the proof of, of times passing is that my coffee has now reached a, a temperature <laughs> which is, uh, let's say, not, not optimal. Um, so, and, and, and the little bar is getting The, the bar end. is getting close to the end. To Anybody the end, watching can see that. <laughs> I mean, I could talk to you for so much longer about this, uh, but, but time does pass. We have run out. But, Carlo, it was a real pleasure to read your book. And uh, um, especially on top of the previous book, Seven Brief Lessons, as I say, you have this ability to to make the very, very complicated concepts that you're talking about accessible, easy to understand, uh, and I can't thank you enough for that. You make me feel far more clever than I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.